the friends of the library put this on and our function which we're able to exercise through contributions we have envelopes over there if you care to join we do various things for the library the children's programs the equipment these programs and uh, generally try to fill in where the library itself may not have the funds immediately available so we believe in the library and uh, it, it's been a wonderful asset in the community if you become a friend you're on the mailing list this particular one if you care to take there some over there which announces this program also announces our other spring programs thinking about things in general I was remember reading something that made a point which said that uh, in discussing determinism versus free will which I guess you can discuss at some length somebody said well determinism is the hand you're dealt and free will is how you play it so I imagine we may hear something of that this evening at any rate oh I am Fred Rosenberg of the Friends so you know who is accosting you I'd like to like to introduce Jesse Cohn who set up this program and is responsible for it she'll introduce our speaker Thank you, and good evening. I first became aware of Cavalier Lee Stringer when I read an article in the New York Times about this intriguing man in his book, Grand Central Winter, Stories from the Street. When I read the book, it seemed to me that Lee Stringer's story had all the elements of a fascinating memoir and possibly the makings of an appealing motion picture. Finally, I concluded that his story would make a good program for the Friends of the Mamaroneck Library, especially since he grew up in Mamaroneck and is presently residing here and working at the Mamaroneck Avenue School. Tonight, I think he will speak of his descent from running a successful design studio with a partner to drug addiction to being evicted from his west side apartment, to inhabiting a cubby hole in the bowels of Grand Central and living as a homeless person. 45,000 copies of his book have been sold. It's written in a half dozen languages and it's published in eight countries. Mr. Stringer is currently working on a second book from which he'll read tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce Cavalier Lee Stringer, author of Grand Central Winter, Stories from the Street. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, that was a very nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming. I'm glad to see the room filled up. I'm always amazed when people come out in, in this modern age to to see something as low-tech as a guy reading a book. <laughs> but um, I'm glad to see you. I just came from, uh, so the graces of some friends, uh, I just came from uh, Charlie Brown's restaurant for dinner. That's why I was a little late in getting here early. So if you detect the slight air of salmon wafting across the room, <laughs> you'll know that that's Charlie Brown's salmon. Um, Yes, the Grand Central Winter. Some of you may be familiar with the book. This is it right here. Some of you may not. So, uh, but uh, Jesse did a good, pretty good introduction. And I used to, uh, in reading, sort of give you the whole backstory, and then I would read, and then I'd go to my favorite part, which is talking with you folks, in sort of an informal question and answer thing. But I found that that if I was too complete up front in telling my story. There weren't any questions left. So I'm just going to tell you just a little about the book, and I'm going to read from the book, and then whatever else you want to know, you can put your hands in the air, and we'll talk about it. Um, Grand Central, first of all, I will read from Grand Central, I, and I, as she said, I would like to also read two other pieces, an excerpt from Grand Central. This is sort of the triple play here. And next, the, uh, the afterword, which will be in addition to the paperback um, 
uh, edition of Grand Central Winter, which was it will be published in the fall by Washington Square Press. Um, and I'd like to read that uh, to you. And uh, there's a book I'm working on now, which is another memoir. I wanted to go right to fiction because there were things I wanted to do that fiction seemed suited for. And I wanted to master the short story form. But en route to, to sort of sketching out the possibility of another memoir, I came, uh, you know, I, I discovered that I can do everything I wanted to do, create an effective kind of short story, and make it as gripping and compelling as fiction. So the next book will be a memoir, and i uh, read a piece from that to you tonight. Um, Grand Central Winter is a story of a guy who sort of falls off the earth in the middle of the 80s. And before he falls off the earth, however, he's, there's not much in the 80s that's giving him all that much satisfaction. The very, remember, the 80s are all about acquisitiveness and upsizing and making the buck. It was our patriotic duty to go out and mass consume. And uh, so this fellow was, was in this kind of state when uh, some people close to him passed away. And the, the effects of that eventually led to a depression. He ends up on, on having a 12-year odyssey on the streets of New York City. It's also a book about the 80s. It's a book about New York City. It's a book about the streets. Um, I'd like to say it's fiction. Um, I'd like to think it reads like fiction. But in fact, it's a true story. And the, the, the main character was me. So this is Grand Central Winter. Um, quick note, uh, Grand Central Winter is published by Seven Stories Press, which is a modest imprint. And they have gotten it down to a science where they can you know, take a first writer like myself, publish, uh, you know, sell maybe six, 7,000 copies, make a profit at that level, and develop, um, you know, develop the author to a next book and a next book. And this was indeed the plan for Grand Central Winter. But um, what happened, the backstory was so compelling, and uh, enough people liked the book in terms of reviewers and, and, the, and the initial audience that we did, uh, we're closing in on doing, selling six times as many books, more closer to 60,000, plus sales all over Europe. So uh, I think it's a book you'd like to read, those of you who haven't. And I um, certainly hope it's a book you'd like to hear, at least, because that's what I'm going to do next. Uh, and the piece I'd like to read from you, read to you from the book, involves, well, when I was, when I hit the street, I had that you still have to make a living, still have to have some dollars in your pocket, particularly if you were what I was on the street, and I was a professional crackhead when I was on the street, and that's a very expensive job. It takes up a lot of time, it takes up a lot of money, it takes up a lot of spirit. So I had to make money. And the first thing I discovered on the street, I got into the semi-precious metal reclamation and recycling business. I picked up cans. <laughs> because in Grand Central, then 100, 200,000 people a day walk through Grand Central. And in Grand Central, they haven't fixed the water fountain in 30 years. So if you're thirsty, you got to buy. And, when, and those cans and bottles have to go somewhere, and they went into my black bag and into the store, and that's how I made a living, a nickel a pop. Um, even while I was out there, I heard that in Detroit, they give you 10 cents a can. And I had this fantasy of moving to Detroit, <laughs> and becoming rich, you know, becoming a can baron, you know. The other thing I did um, in, my, in my, let's see, this was my maybe third or third year out there, a gentleman named Hutchinson Persons came up with a novel concept for the homeless. It was a paper called Street News. And the idea was Street News was a means to make an, a living. They, we bought it for, originally for a quarter. We sell, sold it for 75 cents. And we kept the difference. And uh, well, before I read, I'd also like to say hello to the people watching on TV. I bet you're getting some great lens flare off of these uh, glasses here. But this is the story of, I'm going to, this little piece goes into one night out there selling street news. <clears throat> when
When Street News first, first came out, the, sh the sh number six train was one of the best trains for selling papers. I could get on a Grand Central with 100 papers during the rush hour, ride down the city hall and back, and most of the papers would be gone. That was back when street news was really when Wall Street was really pumping and the train would be full of stockbrokers. Those guys really got off on seeing a guy hustle. The very smell of enterprise gave them a hard on. To them, we street news vendors were a reassuring sight. Living ratification of the humanity to be found in brisk commerce. These days, although Wall Street is pumping again, the mood is different. Standing up and reeling off a speech is not the attention getter it once was. Most people have become used to the drill and weary of it to boot. Now we only remind them of a problem that they wish to turn the corner on and be done with. We are in the very unsalesmanlike business of defying popular demand. The first car of the Uptown Six is crowded and noisy, and it doesn't abate when I start my spiel. But I go through with it anyway. Persistence, they say, overcomes resistance. When I'm finished, a guy at the end of the car who could not have heard a word weighs me over. He gives me a dollar, but refuses the paper. I can't even push it on him. This is no boon to my spirits, but a dollar is a dollar. I get off the six at 86th Street and head for my spot. As always, the evening streets buzz with money on the hoof. During the Roaring 80s, a 10-block melange of bars, clubs, and late-night restaurants was forged out of this once sleepy residential area. It is now unofficially known as the Strip. And every night, it plays host to a festive, moneyed, often boisterous crowd hell-bent on pursuing a little after-dark diversion. <laughs> it's work hard and play hard all the way for these folks. Earn it by day, blow it off by night. The hustlers have followed the money up here. Street walkers play the turf along 2nd and 3rd Avenues within a four block radius of 86th Street. Ad hoc pot dealers loiter along 87th, midway between Lex and 3rd. And from 84th to 94th, a rogues gallery of panhandlers work the constantly moving horde. You see them shaking their cups outside over jammed watering holes hovering in front of the busy restaurants and fast food franchises, and working the doors at bank cash machines. Some are solemn, perched silently on the ground with a cardboard sign, or rooted in one spot, methodically shaking a cup. Some press a song or dance upon you, ambling along at your side, daring you to blow them off without so much as a dime. Others imagine themselves host of the ball, yanking open taxi and limo doors as they slide up to the curb, welcoming you out to the night, reciting the pleasures that await you. It makes for an interesting study in forced coexistence. Even the weekend warriors who descend on the strip from out of town every Friday night seem to regard the hustling homeless as part of the landscape. Live, slice-of-life displays in a hodgepodge urban theme park. They are spur some change, incantations, and the chime of coins ringing in their cups, part of the streets discordant music. Meanwhile, those people who lack the guile to coax a fair buck from the passing trade subsist on petty crime, breaking in the cars, peddling the loot cut rate to the guys in the Korean stores, doctoring the coin returns on pay phones, coming back later to collect the money jammed up in them, rifling the pockets of passed out drunks yelling, are you all right? as they commit their cool larceny. The blue and whites keep a constant rolling vigil, scooping up the drunk, deranged, and dangerous, or idle in front of the madhouse joints, intervening solemnly when the volatile combination of alcohol and testosterone begins to combust. The hustle on the strip is fed by the action just north of 96th Street. Those who've earned who scared up their cop money fly to Spanish Harlem, where crack comes packaged in as little as $2 one-hit vials. Then they do their duty in doorways and cubby holes, their disembodied faces flaring tangerine in the sudden glow of their igniting stems, then twitch off the high away from the lighted places, keeping their misery tucked into the shadows. I work on the periphery of it all, 
in front of the Love Pharmacy on the southwest corner of 84th and 3rd. The large apartment building that looms over this intersection feed me a regular trickle of customers from the neighborhood. And the strip feeds me a constant stream of fresh through traffic. There isn't time enough as they walk by for a proper sales pitch. I play off the spare changers down the block. We don't shake a cup, we sell street news, I chant in counterpoint to their bother. Latest issue, just one buck. The people who work inside the love store have been friendly to me. They often step out and buy a copy. They wish me luck and good night when they lock up for the evening. Sometimes they throw me a pack of cigarettes. A couple of doors down, there's a trendy quick cut hair salon. Ladies wander in plain and curious and stride out bold, assured, and freshly quaffed. They wink at me as they pass. The gay hairdresser sometimes comes to buy in a gush. He does everything in a gush, it seems. <laughs> Even the Chinese from the restaurant down the block will sometimes come nodding over. They all buoy my spirits, make me feel like a celebrity. We don't shake a cup. A guy wearing about half a grand's worth of leather on his back makes his way across the street, a sleek, slender, and blonde fox riding his arm. He knows he's got the world by the balls. You can see it in his walk. He pops a crooked grin on his face, figures to have a laugh here. Hey, dude, he says, already amused with himself. I'm a little short. Can you spare some change? But he's not ready for me. I reach in my pocket and come up with a dollar for him. It's cheap, really, visibility for a buck. There you go, I say brightly. Hey, man, I, I was only kidding, he tells me. Red face now in front of his girl. Just wanted to see what I'd do, peg me for a panhandle and thought he'd have some fun. But the buck is his. I insist, I won't take it back. He can only live with this for about five steps down the block. When he turns on his heels, ambles back up to me and slides a ten into my palm. Now he insists. Now he won't take it back. Okay, I say you win. I know when I've been outdone, both he and his girl beaming now, he reels her back in against his hip, a big shot once again. Street news, latest issue, only a dollar. A little later, I take a break, make a beer run, get a 16 ounce at the deli down the block. I down it quickly in the shadows. My customers would not approve. I betray them in taking pleasure as a fruit of their patronage. <coughs> The beer takes the edge off the monotony, though, puts me in a mellow harmony with the moment. No rush, the money will come. It's a fine night, a perfect breezeless 80 degrees. People are having a good time, walking their dogs, chatting with their neighbors, closing the details of deals on the corner, dashing in and out of taxis, dipping in and out of the joints, zipping by on skateboards, on bicycles, on rollerblades, laughing, singing, shouting to the sky. The people who know me say hi as they pass, throw me a little wave, a few stop to talk, want to know how the paper's doing, want to know how I'm doing, want to know how the Mets are doing. On nights like this, selling street news is as good as any other grind. There's life in the mix. I'm thinking maybe, maybe I won't go uptown tonight. Maybe I'll go back to the office, nurse a 40 hours in front of the TV. I don't have to go crazy every night. I see one of my regulars approaching in his trademark charcoal ch chalk and chalk stripe and burgundy tie. He's with his son, a typical antsy toddler in two large baseball cap, ambling along beside him. How are you doing, he asks. I'm doing great, I tell him. He looks down at his son and puts a buck in the kid's hand. The kid's face lights up. Daddy is being generous but it's not what the kid thinks. <laughs> Give the man a dollar, Daddy says. But the kid is just like any other kid. He likes the feel of his own crisp buck in his hand. Come on, honey, give the man the dollar, Daddy coaxes. The kid peers up at me, betraying just a hint of contempt. I don't blame him. I'd happily slip him five bucks not to look at me like that. But his father has a purpose in mind. 
He reaches down, slides the bill from Junior's tiny fingers, and hands it over to me. Now take the paper, Daddy tells him. The boy reaches for it sheepishly. Remember what I told you, Daddy says? The kid shakes his head, yes, resigned to the coming bit of drudgery. What is the man doing, Daddy prompts. He's selling papers, the boy intones. And why is he selling papers, Daddy wants to know. So he won't be homeless anymore, the kid replies and buries his face in the cloth of Daddy's trousers. Very good, Daddy says, civics lesson over. Off they go down the street. I count my money. 23 dollars and change. That'll have to be enough. I tell myself and step off with a robust, purposeful stride. The man doesn't really deserve my resentment. He was only trying to do the right thing. Nor would it do any good to tell him that I am no longer completely homeless, that I work for the paper and sleep in the office, that I imagine myself a writer of sorts. Contrary to its stated mission, these are things that selling street news cannot deliver. That part is an inside job. But I don't know this yet. I fly along the pavement, voices and faces blurring by like walls of the tunnel. As I hurry on, counting off the remaining blocks, clout clutching the stem in my pocket, not stopping until I reach the spot I'm looking for, just a few blocks north of 96th Street. Thank you. Um, well, I already told you this, this is going to be my intro. I think I'll do it this way. Um, I'm working on a second book, and uh, I'm anxious to read this excerpt from the second book. It happened in, just before we moved to Mamaroneck. Uh, and I'm anxious to read it because my mother's sitting out here in the audience. I don't think she's seen this. And uh, that's my mother right there. Okay. I have some other friends out here. There's people I work with. There's Ms. Onassis, who I, who's an assistant principal of the best elementary school in Mamaroneck, which is the Mamaroneck Avenue School. And an old, an old, uh, an old fr friend, I don't mean he's old. Well, he's old, too. We're both <laughs> old. But way, from way back when I worked for the Instructional Material Centers uh, in Mamaroneck, Cal Schlick, once superintendent of schools at once. Anyone else I know that I've left out, please forgive me. Um, so, so this is just a little piece of my life at six years old that you might find interesting. <clears throat> it must have been a Saturday or Sunday because the weekends were for the visits. And Mama had gotten Wayne and I presentation ready and sat us in the parlor to await the ding-dong of the doorbell. We are now sitting stiff and quiet on the big couch with that passive anticipation that toddlers sometimes have. It is plush, snug, and comfortable, Mama's house. A womb outside of the womb. Its rooms over furnished with plump, upholstered things. Its windows shrouded in drapery. Its floors all covered with dark, musty carpets and rugs. Everything conspired to mute and blunt the outside world. A womb a place in which to entomb oneself, care and worry, worry free. There is a narrow dining room, the quietest place of all, the place of my earliest ever memory, me on my back, gaping up at the eggshell blur of the ceiling, grown-ups towering over me, their voices dampened to a purr, their faces bent low, hovering just beyond the range of my vision, smiles spreading their vague faces, reaching in to wiggle a finger, to tickle a toe, to push a dimple into my cheek. Just that one early memory, and then nothing for many years. There was a large eat-in kitchen, furnished during the magic age of aluminum, with a big formica-type table the color of watermelon in the middle, perched on spindly aluminum tube legs, around which we kids gathered on tubular aluminum frame chairs mesmerized, our mouths watering as Mama concocted a batch of Kool-Aid as only she could make it, 
two or three flavors blended together in proportions only she knew, then stirred with a long wooden spoon in a sweating aluminum pot, paper-thin discs of lemon bobbing on the surface, the ice cubes rattling out the sides. We drank out of aluminum cups, tinted metallic blue and red, and painted smiley faces with our fingers on the sides where the moisture had condensed. Me wondering what kind of magic Mama puts at work that made her Kool-Aid taste like no other in the world. There was a living room, nice and square but dark, with heavy drapes that are always drawn against the rudeness of the sun. Their florid pattern, the green of the vines swirling against the red of roses, cascading from ceiling to floor. Every chair in the room is an easy chair. Every table is topped with a doily, and every doily adorned with bric-a-brac, tiny sepia-toned photographs and little gold-tinted tin frames, lime and cream-colored ceramic table lamps with white ruffled fringe shades all turning pea-colored with age. Then there's the big couch, so swollen with goose feathers it halfway swallows your butt when you sit in it. And next to it, a big boxy console TV. Years later, when Wayne and I will return as gangling preteens to Mama's house, the new baby, a toddler in PJs, will lay my thumb open with a razor blade as I sit on the rug gaping at that TV. Lord knows where she got her hands on the thing. I won't feel it when she does this, the razor being so sharp. I will only look down for a moment and wonder what's up with all the blood. Mama, of course, will know just what to do. Her ever-concerned brow steepening, she'll seize my hand in hers, walk me into the bathroom, bind my bleeding thumb in tissues, then march me off to the drugstore down the street for a butterfly stitch to close it up. And, so long as we're there, top it off with an egg cream for me and soda fountain. There were the rooms in which we slept, we kids, five of us at home, Margaret, Marilyn, Adrian, Wayne, and I. Oddly, I have no recollections there. I could not tell you a thing about what my bedroom looked like, what things I kept heaped in the corner, what creatures laid in wait in the closet or lurked underneath the bed. Nothing. I do remember the steep, wide flight of stairs I climbed to the second floor each night, the same stairs upon which I once suddenly seized Margaret, 87 pounds of horsey homeliness, and without the slightest regard for her consent, attempted to plant a wet one on her trembling lips, David Niven style, just as I had seen him do in the movie that afternoon. Mama was livid walking in on this tableau, Margaret flat against the stairs, me squirming on top of her, and let loose a scalding reproach, a thing she really found, rarely found cause to do, and which left me bewildered for days. I remember the stairs, but I cannot tell you if it was right or left that I turned at the top of them to go off to bed. There is a skinny parlor at the side of the house. By virtue of a bank of lace curtain windows along one wall, the brightest room of all. It must have a western exposure because the sun never shines directly in, which is why, I suppose, it has been spared the obligatory drapery. This was the place of Wayne's big discovery one afternoon. The two of us sitting there with nothing in particular to do, vaguely listening to the radio, purring from the other room. Perry Como crooning, catch a falling star and put it in your pocket, save it for a rainy day, and that peaches and cream monotone of his. Then Wayne, suddenly rising from his chair, an otherworldly look in his eyes, and wandering, slow and distracted, <coughs> as if commanded by some inner voice, over to the old upright in the corner of the room flipping the keyboard open and flawlessly tapping out the melody. Catch a falling star and put it in your pocket, never let it fade away. Then Mama hurrying into the room, cooing with delight, drying her hands on her old apron, her butterscotch brown fingers entwined in its fading lilacs. Oh, sweet Lord in heaven, she says, Wayne abruptly halting, unable to read right off whether he pleased or offended. But then Mama's stubby little arms fly out, and she enfolds them in them, her face glimmering like the new day sun. <laughs> Would you listen to that, she all but sings, as God is my witness, you have a gift. What is it that I remember feeling then? Awe or envy? 
So we are sitting and waiting for the visit, Wayne and I. It will be the last of the visits, but we do not know this yet. Sitting in Mama's house, the epicenter of what is our entire young universe, the dimensions of which extend precisely to the four corners of the property line. From just within the black wrought iron gate in front of the house to the chain link fence at the rear of the concrete yard, a concrete courtyard out back. There is a grape orchard of all things out there. Its vines twining around a barnwood slat frame. The grapes on them plump and purple in summertime, just waiting to burst against your tongue. On the other side of the fence, there is a fertile garden. And every now and then, we'd see a silent, hollow-eyed man busy there, the knees of his baggy green workshop pants brown from the soil, his sleeveless undershirt yellow from years of sweat. Sometimes he would look up and pluck a flat, fat fig or two for us and pass it through the fence. Is good, huh? was all he'd ever say, not being all that familiar with English. And sometimes he'd have a bottle of white rock ginger ale with him, and for our amusement, he'd shake the thing up, plugging the top with his leathery thumb, then hold it up to our ears so we could listen to the bubbles hiss and pop. I spent countless solitary hours out there, slumped on the floor of the vineyard, and Mama would slap the dirt up from the seat of my trousers when I came back inside, saying, Lord, child, look at you. Can't you take a little more care, like your brother? And I would despise Wayne and his fussy ways for the rest of the day. Lord, 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 Mama would shake her head. Mama seemed to have some sort of special arrangement with the Lord. A couple of times a year, she would be stricken with some sudden and mysterious physical affliction for which there was neither cause or cure. One time there was a lump in her side, big as a grapefruit, I heard her say. And she moped around the house in slow motion for days, her worry lines etched deeper than ever. And then, bang, a few days later, it was all over. Yes, Lord, it was a miracle, if she'd say to anyone or no one in particular. I prayed on the Lord, and he healed me just like that. And she'd be walking around humming softly to herself all day, and all would be right with the world again. But it was all very frightening to me this business with the Lord. When the doorbell chimes, I don't hear it. I am lost in the water stain on the parlor ceiling, having just glimpsed in it for a fleeting second what looked like the face of Abraham Lincoln. But now, try as I will, attempting to trick the focus of my eyes with sideways glances, I can't manage to conjure him back up again. It's a meaningless thing, but not being able to do this, but it rankles me beyond all rhyme and reason. Children, I hear Mama's voice approaching. Come now, children, she's here now. Here? Wayne leaps to his feet and hurries to the dining room. I trail behind, still dreaming Abe's bushy face. Our mother meets us halfway. Our mother meets us halfway by the long, narrow dining table, a gray and purple plaid scarf pulled around her head, puts down her bundles, drops to one knee to embrace us, her long gray overcoat gathering in folds at her feet. We press in against her, kiss her cheek, as Mama stands off to the side, her ever busy hands worrying the air in front of her now for want of a purpose. Listen, my mother says with a certain breathlessness, I have good news, words that are often suspect to a kid's ears, him not knowing whether the news will be kid good a grown-up good. Grown-up good often being dim and unfathomable. This news turned out to be grown-up good. My mother had finally been able to move out of the room in the, his sister's house where she had been staying since before Wayne and I were born. She had at last found a place for the three of us to live together. After six years of sleepy, contented existence here in the Bronx, we were about to say goodbye to Mama and her house. Wayne and I accepted this development with little sentiment that I remember, as if we actually understood that this day was to come. But really, being that we had no other point of reference against which to compare circumstances, and therefore no reason to doubt that all children spent the first years of their life with another mama, a woman who took in children, what was there to understand? Thank you.
one more pe one more little piece here, and then uh, we can get to questions and answers. Oh, we're doing good on time. The uh, Grand, when I wrote Grand Central Winter, I didn't want to do the obvious thing. I didn't want to make a make it a recovery story. There was obviously a, there was a drug uh, addiction uh, component, but I didn't want to just you know make it a recovery story. It's the it wasn't the before or after, but the stuff in the middle that interested me. So that's the way I wrote the book. And a lot of people were interested, I, I later found out, in what happened when I decided to stop doing what I was doing, and a little bit about how that went. So when the, the paperback rights were bought by Washington Square Park, they asked me to write on this, and me, being who I am, I couldn't resist the chance to tell another story. So I'll share that with you now. And then we can do some questions and answers. Project Renewal, Lower East Side, May 1996. I am, I am counting days. This, I just finished this, so I may trip up on it. I, this is brand new. I am counting days. That's what they call it when you're starting out getting yourself straight from whatever it is you've been hooked on or into. I have 30 of them under my belt, clean and sober days, though not by my own effort. I am in what's known as a therapeutic community, a place called Project Renewal. Ironically, it's in the same building that I stumbled upon a decade earlier looking to get a pair of shoes. Only these days, the place is being run by a whole different regime. Now they serve up hard-lying drug treatment along with three hots and a cop. This treatment thing isn't anything like I thought it would be, though I couldn't tell you what I thought. What I can tell you is that I'm not thrilled being here, packed in with 300 plus other men not of my choosing, especially since the people who run this program are so big on confrontation, keeping things so that you're constantly right in each other's face. The thinking is that all of us being druggies and drunks, we've been self-medicating ourselves so long we've lost the knack of dealing with our emotions. And they figure confrontation is the best way to drive our feelings out in the open. This has made me realize how I have tended to limit myself to safe company all my life, except maybe when I'm high. Don't ask me to describe exactly what I mean by safe company. It's a play it by ear kind of thing. So being here is no picnic for me. But I'm not here for a vacation. I'm here to get myself clean. I guess you can say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. What happened was, I was three weeks into a binge, subsidized by a bank card that didn't belong to me, when one night I ran into a smoking buddy of mine, we'll call him Irish, slumped on a stoop near Port Authority, looking like he'd just been told he had a terminal disease. And I thought I'd cheer him up with a hit or two. Now, Irish had helped me smoke up the first chunk of advance money I got for writing this book. The deal I made with him was, I share my get high with you, and you do all the running back and forth to the cop man. He surprised me a few weeks later by returning the favor, and quid pro quo being such a rare thing between crackheads, this put him in a good light with me. But when I offered him this hit, he just said, I got, folding down his ear to show me the two dime bags there. Thing is, I'm so freaking, I'm going to replace the word in deference to my young, the young lady in the office, or with a less offensive word. I'm so freaking disgusted with myself, I don't even feel like smoking it. I asked him what he's disgusted about, and he described, in bloody, scatological detail, the precise means by which he had hustled up the money to cop. It involved his obliging the sadosexual fantasies of some sorry twisted sucker by putting his fist where it was never intended to go. I'm so freaking disgusted, he said again. You're disgusted, I told him, thinking of all the cash machine withdrawals I'd made on the stolen plastic. Shoot, I just graduated to the big leagues, grand freaking larceny. I sat down next to him because I really liked this guy. It wasn't just the crack. And, be, and neither of us said a word for a bit. Ninth Avenue was unusually still and quiet, offering us little distraction from the business of taking a good hard look at what we each had become. 
So, I said after a while, you ever think of going for treatment? The question being for me as much as for him. Been thinking about it, Iris said, staring straight ahead. This both surprised and encouraged me. I dug up what cash I had of my pockets and began counting. A hint of a flame rose in Iris's eyes. Look, I said, I'll make you a deal. I got three, almost 400 here. We'll spend the whole thing. Get us a couple of bundles of crack in a room, find us a couple of skeezers, get our jammies waxed. Only we give each other his word that when it's all over, we both go check ourselves in the treatment. One last run and that's it. This got his attention. Bet, he said. Well, come on, me and you are going to party, I said, echoing the rally cry of an earlier, kinder day when I, when I heard that first hit of crack click against the plate. But both of us being longtime veterans of the pipe, Irish and I were way past the party days. The psyche can, after all, only take but so much hypersensation. Somewhere along the line, your circuit simply short out. After that, all you ever get for your hit is raw, angry nerves, a queasy dread bubbling in your gut, and a frightening sense of vulnerability to the spine. Five minutes after booking ourselves into a flea bag room, firing up our pipes and getting that first rush, the two of us were seized by crack paranoia. Me, stationed by the window, peering out through the edge of the shade, my back flat against the wall like a corner B-movie gangster, and Irish, trembling and sweaty, hovering at the door, his eye glued to the peephole. Whatever it was we imagined out there coming to get us wasn't going to take us by surprise. No sooner did the rush subside, and we are back sucking on our stems again for another lunatic dose. We spent the better part of the next six hours locked in this grim ritual. And at the end of it, we emerged, stumbling, bleary-eyed and ragged into the late morning light, and slouching along the streets, headed for who knows where, I happened to glimpse our reflections in the store window. We both had that same defeated look on our faces, a look that says, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, I said, I still on the window, with the hollow-eyed alien cells gaping back at us. What do you say we go get ourselves some help? We dragged our ragged out bodies over to Grand Central, to the outreach center the Good Samaritans run there, ready to sign ourselves in, and found a blizzard of qualifying paperwork standing between us and treatment. Government issued ID, which I didn't have, being paramount among the requirements. Irish, who had an old Medicaid card in his wallet, managed to negotiate this gauntlet first. And I sat by, agitated, as they handed him a referral slip, directions of project renewal, $3 car fare, and sent him on his way. I despaired seeing him go out that door. Three bucks was money enough for a wake-up tray. This is bull, this red tape, I grumbled to myself. Don't these people know how fragile the resolve is that brings people in here? And it was all the reason I needed to stalk out the door then and there, chase down Irish, and make sure he wasn't going for a hit without me. I didn't do this, but not because of my firm character. It was just that a tray is such a pitiful amount to split two ways. That's what kept me here long enough to think of calling George McDonald and telling him they were refusing to refer me for treatment without proper ID. George runs the Doe Fund, the homeless organization he and his wife Harriet founded in memory of the, an unidentified homeless woman who froze to death on the street Christmas Eve after being kicked out of the Grand Central and ended up among all the other Jane Doe's buried in Potter's Field. I met him one night, way back when I first hit the street. He was standing outside of Grand Central with a van full of sandwiches, giving them out to anyone hungry, and I struck up a conversation with him. The thing about him and his wife is that they always seemed more interested in me than in my circumstances, which made me feel that the friendship between us was coincidental to their help the homeless thing. Anyway, I called George and he told me, just sit tight, let me see what I can do. And 15 minutes later, a letter <coughs> rolled off the Good Samaritan's fax machine, personally vouching for me, and I was on my way. I was happy to find Irish here, warming a chair in the day room when I checked in. 
I figured we would be brothers in recovery, leaning on each other when the going got rough. Only Irish didn't make the long haul. The stuff they pull here got him spinning so bad he walked out. Spinning, that's what they call it, is when they got you going every which way at once. They do this deliberately, like scheduling you to be in group and at your house job both at the same time, knowing you can't be in two places at once, just so they can see how you handle it. With Irish, they promise him right off you'll be allowed to call home. He told them he wanted to get his fa let his family know he was all right, but I know that what he really wanted was for them to send him some money. But they keep putting it off and putting it off, stringing him along for a good two weeks, and the next thing I know, he's out the door in a huff, his clothes in a plastic bag he slung over his shoulder. I have no doubt he'll be back getting high in no time. And despite that I know good and well this will only buy him more pain and madness, a shudder of envy goes through me thinking of him out there. I even toy with the idea of splitting the program myself. But I am stopped by the most unlikely of things, my ego. If I walked out, I'd be admitting to everyone there that I couldn't cut it, that I had failed the program. And I'm just too needy of being well thought of to do this. Still in all, they come close to spinning me out of there too. In a head-to-head -head with one of the counselors, a stout almond-skinned woman who takes herself and her job very seriously, I am asked what kind of prospects I see myself as having at the end of treatment. Why, I'm a writer, I say with cocktail hour, uh, cocktail hour casualness. I have a contract to write a book. Yes, yes, she says, but it will certainly take you some time to finish this book. How are you going to make a living in the meantime? Well, as I said, I'm a writer. Uh, I'm not completely without contacts. There's more than a good chance I could land a column or something. Maybe not at the Times, but something. She leans forward in her chair in deference to the gravity of her next question. But what if it turns out that you couldn't write? I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean. I stutter, panic rising. I mean, she says, what if you had to do something else for a living? I just gaped back at her. It had never occurred to me that I wouldn't continue writing. And I realized right then and there that all through the dogged and solemn grind this treatment business is proving itself to be, I have been clinging to the idea of finishing Grand Central Winter like a shipwrecked man clings to a reef. It is the light at the other end of my tunnel. Look, she says, her eyes drilling into mine, the need being to peer beyond whatever words I might say, to glimpse, if she can, into the depths of my soul. Were you writing while you were active? Yes. And what did you do with the money? I bought drugs. Right, she says, pulling the string on the trap she has set. So now what happens when you leave here and go right back to that same lifestyle? So this is what she's getting at. I have only myself to blame walking into that one. I know the drill by now. Since getting high is all about instant gratification, it's counterproductive within a therapeutic community, giving any of us what we covet. Yet I had gone right ahead and blurted my ambitions. The unasked question, am I willing to give up everything familiar to me for the sake of my recovery, hangs in the air between us me hating the very thought of it, and at the same time knowing from the endless round of lectures I've already sat through, from all the Hazleton videos we've been obliged to watch, and all the recovery literature that I have put into my hands, that the questions you hate most are precisely the ones you have to tackle. Of course, I am expected to answer, yes, I am willing to go to any lengths for the sake of my recovery. Those are the openers in this business of getting and staying clean. But it has also been impressed upon me that only rigorous honesty will serve this purpose well. It will do me no good to simply tell this woman what she wants to hear. If I can't write, I can't write, I finally say with more confidence than I actually feel. But to my surprise, I discover at the same time that I actually do mean what I am saying.
that that's how much I do not want to fail the program. There's no reading how the counselor takes this. She settles back in her chair and plods on down the bill of particulars she must ask me, by which means I presume she's able by some unfathomable code to sort out the true state of my recovery. When it is over, she utters a thank you, designed to convey nothing more than that she has done with me. As I leave her office, a rush of what's termed consequential thinking kicks in. I begin to mull over the legal trouble not finishing this book could bring me since the advance money I had been fronted went up in smoke. I shudder at the thought of having to face all the naysayers who doubted my having the stuff to produce the book in the first place. I chew on the unappetizing prospect of being released back into the world not as the budding author I imagined, but as just another reformed crackhead starting from zero all over again. But then I recall the words of Mr. Jones from half a lifetime ago, back when I peddled vacuum cleaners for a not so reputable firm door to door up and down Gun Hill Road. Mr. Jones being, of course, the husband of Mrs. Jones, the salesman's perennial name for all female prospects, whom I had managed to enamor of the $500 machine I was hawking. At issue was the snaky sales contract, which not only exacted a usurious annual percentage rate for buying on time, but was configured so as to oblige you to pay interest on the interest itself. Try as he did, Mr. Jones just couldn't reconcile why this should be. And desperate to fill my quota, I pushed every button I could to close the deal, even going so far as to suggest the need for solidarity between brothers of color. He was a young man, and he carried himself with quiet serenity, never rising to anger in the face of my dogged persistence, never becoming flustered by my abstruse arguments. And after a good 20 minutes or so of back and forth with me, he finally sighed, still not at all satisfied he wasn't being taken for a ride, and picked up the pen. Well, he said, signing the contract with an offhand shrug, I'll still have to get up and go to work tomorrow regardless. Later, during a cigarette break, me and my fellow partners in recovery mutely puffing away in the yard behind the facility, each of us contemplating the distance just to go before we can truly declare ourselves free, the simple grace of Mr. Jones' words works like a salve on my psyche, releasing me from the tyranny of expectation. I begin to feel the most peaceful, zen-like satisfaction blossoming in each moment that passes. And then I am giddy with it, realizing in one swooping rush that this is precisely the feeling we were all really groping for every time we reached for the pipe. Half a dozen months from now, when I will be well into the outpatient phase of my treatment, when I will have found through the happy discovery that it is not a necessary, necessary condition of my recovery that I give the writing thing up, that few things come back to be so completely yours as that you stand willing to let go. My new counselor then, a recovered alcoholic who has been through the 12 steps and has reached a spiritual awakening because of it, will impart to me another memorable gem. The door to hell always locks from the inside, he'll say, and I will know exactly what he means. But right now, taking a page from Mr. Jones' book, I allow myself a me mental shrug. Whatever the day may bring, I tell myself, and it is like waking from the dead. Thank you very much for this. Now, for the fun part, um, I'm sure some of you have, you can ask me about, uh, you can certainly ask me about writing. I love to talk about writing. You can now ask me anything you want about the streets or my life. Just one request, when you raise your hand and I point to you, say your name, so I'd like to address you by name. Yes, ma'am. I'm Janet. Hi, Janet. Hi. Um, when you were a small boy, do you have memories of wanting to not as a small boy. But what did happen, um, 
was very, a very strange thing happened. When we moved to Mamaroneck, it was kind of a culture shock for me. And I remember coming out of Central School one day, and there was this kid there, and I remember his name. His name was Richard Flamberg. Richard Flamberg had been blessed with everything that I thought I would never have. He was good looking, he was popular, he was smart, his parents had money, and uh, good at sports, everything. And I'm walking out one day, fairly new in the Marinick, and he's leaning against the wall with such casualness. And all of a sudden, I became enraged that he could be so casual having all these gifts. The next thing I knew, I was drawing my fist back and he was bleeding from the nose. I punched him for no reason. He'd never done a thing to me. For years, I wondered what that was all, what happened, what that was all about. And then uh, one day I either found or saw a book called, and it's The Invisible Man, The Invisible Man. And I thought, oh, this is the science fiction. Uh, you know, and I opened the book and I started reading it, but it was Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And I'm reading this first chapter, and I'm reading exactly what happened to me, what happens to that character. Those of you who read the book, he talks about this phantom leaping out of him and nearly killing a man. And that completely blew my mind that I should pick up a book and it should knew exactly what uh, things I didn't even know that I'd gone, I'd gone through but didn't even know what they were about. So that got me into reading. And uh, if you read a lot, I think you're halfway to writing, if you, you know. Anyone else? Question? Yes, hi. When, when did you decide to, to write this book? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm rude. <laughs> when you started to uh, write this book, obviously you were uh -huh. in somewhat of disarray. What made you start to write it? Well, it, it wasn't kind of a unilateral decision. What happened was I sold street news for quite a while, and then uh, how did the... I, well, this, this is a chapter that starts the book. I, 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 I used to carry this pencil around as a drug implement to pack the screens in my stem. And one day I had no drugs and no money and I, had, and I wanted to kill some time, so I pull out this pencil and I said, and I realized it's a pencil, you know, that you can write with the thing too. And I started writing just to kill time. And I ended up writing this whole story Long story short, I take it over the street news, wondering if anybody wanted, if they wanted to publish it, and bang, open up the next issue, and there's my story. So that got me started, and I uh, then, uh, st little by little, I became a writer and editor for street news. And uh, a publisher on the, was on the subway one day, and he bought a copy of street news, and lucky for me, the train was stuck for 20 minutes and he sat there in those 20 minutes and read the whole paper and I had about three or four articles in there. I did a column called Ask Homely, Ask Homely, Ask Homey, which was a Q&A. You, you write in and any questions you have about the streets or people on the streets or whatever and he would answer it. I had a column called Graffiti, I had a column called Tales from the Rails and uh, apparently he liked what he saw he called up my editor and said he wanted to meet me, and I went, I smelled money. <laughs> I showed up the next day. And, uh, and he, he said this and that, and said perhaps I'd be interested in doing a book. And I said something uh, on the, along the order of humana, 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 humana. <laughs> and they signed me up anyway, and, uh, and that, that's pretty much how it's, you know. I had made other attempts at writing, but you know, you sort of, you can, you can, there's a lot of people who want to write, but a lot of people who, fewer people who want to write like a writer wants to write. Back then, I wanted to write like this. I wanted to write, well, look, if I can get a real good book and it's real exciting, like maybe like, you know, Howell Robbins or something, and then I'll get it published and it'll sell a lot of copies and I'll be rich. That's not how a writer wants to write. So it was a lot different, and I wasn't, you know, I never did write that book to get rich. But I did write this book to write the book. It's a whole different frame of mind. Liz yes, Cubby. Liz Covey. Oh, I'm sorry, I should wait for you. Um, <laughs> I want to know a little more about the shelters and why do people feel um, they're more safe on the street? Why can you go into the city, you see 
mm -hmm. young girl died huddled in Randy mm -hmm. Central Station, and they could go to the shelters, but I heard they weren't safe. There's a bunch of things uh, involved there. Number one, um, first of all, there, there, are, there aren't any city-run shelters anymore. They're all treatment centers. Cities out of the shelter business. Um, but my experience, and I, I have it in the book, with the shelter, uh, or just condition-wise, is that they're ill-supervised, and, and a lot of people, and, and they don't really, the population is, there's a lot of hoods in there. I mean, you get robbed. Uh, there are people get raped, um, people get beaten up. You get a real jailhouse mentality in there. And the reason is, is, that, is that the shelters didn't come out of a desire to house people. It came out of a desire to not get in trouble. The way the shelter system in New York came about was the Coalition for the Homeless saw homelessness as, le as a legal problem. So they, put, they went to Washington and they talked to, legisl to the legislator and they made it, they, 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 they went to court and the courts found that New York City, this is what the courts found, has an obligation to provide all of its citizens shelter on demand. Now, I wouldn't necessarily dispute that, but this is what happened and they passed the law that it's New York City had to. So the New York City shelter system was built out of a desire to comply with the law, see? And there's a difference, because when you're forced or pushed to do something, you're going to do the minimum you have to do to, to not get in trouble. It would have been probably greater if the brain of the people, the powers that be in New York City were inspired to do this out of some sort of human concern which wasn't the case. So that's, that's all the difference in the world. I was in Dallas, Texas re recently speaking with one of the homeless groups there. And that, in Dallas, the interesting thing is that their homeless organizations are grassroots up as opposed to from the top down. I mean, it was amazing. The difference was amazing. I mean, the homeless people are happier. You know, it, it's, if that's an odd thing to say. The, the group I w was the guest speaker for, forget the name of it, Arts for Something, started when this one woman named Carol Brewer, en route to work, would pass this homeless man on the corner every now and then, and he would be whittling a stick. And uh, one day she pulled over and looked at the stick, and it was beautiful. I have one, by the way, you know. And the carved stick, uh, walking stick, and he dyes it and everything. So every now and then she would come by and she would buy another stick, and then she thought, you, well, you need anything, any supplies? So now she started bringing supplies. Before long, there were two guys on the corner, you know? And then three guys, and all artists, you know? She wasn't out to save the world, she wasn't even out to sa save the homeless, just what emanated out of herself ended up t touching 150 people. Now, does that end the problem in, in Dallas? No, but it's a very, organic and real relationship going on here. And now they're, they're built up into it. She just bought a building, and, and it's a big, big, big organization. And it's, and it's, it's everybody there is diff it's different than, than the kind of social worker mentality that, you know, that we've got an engineer society the approach that you see in New York City. These people aren't saying, you know, these people aren't really trying to end homelessness or deal with the issue, they're saying, this exists and this is what I can do. It's a lot simpler. Yes? Yeah, um, uh, in, in that incident, very uh, interesting, uh, with, uh, similarities with Ellison. Could you tell us a little bit about, my name is Marty Renner, by the way. Uh -huh. I think I met you the other, no, perhaps not. Well, yeah. okay. I thought I met you in the TV, you're not connected with the TV thing, right? Never mind, go ahead. <laughs> but I'd like to meet you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, how, how does it feel as, as a black child growing up in the Marinette school in the Marinette? And also, uh, how does the, how did the Marinette, living partially in the Marinette, affect your writing and motivate or influence your writing? Well, yeah, for, for how, how it was like growing up in the Marinette, you're going to have to buy the next book, pal. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> 
in all <laughs> in all seriousness, in all seriousness, um, it was it was a, it was a, it was quite a culture shock for me in a lot of ways. I didn't realize it at first. I mean, you're a kid; it's a big, beautiful world. You don't see differences, um, but there were de there were definite lines. This is definitely a striated community, and uh, the lines become more apparent. And then, as you got older, yeah, as I got older, and, and, and the feeling that, that I was, because of what I was born with, would be consigned to one side of that line, irrespective of, of anything else, I think is what made me punch Richard Flamberg. But I didn't, not consciously, it's just, I was walking around with all this anger at that deal. I said, what a rotten deal. I don't like this deal. How, how, how long have you been in the when that happened? A couple of years. On the other side, we lived on Palmer Avenue, and right across the street, the circus came twice a year. Well, can you beat that? <laughs> right across the street, I'd lie in my bed at night and hear, you know, uh, you know, breathing in the perfume of elephant dung and cotton candy, and hear that music, and Im just imagine all sorts of things. And you know, when we went to the circus, it never lived up to what, what I had created. So I mean, I mean, more and more these days, though, you know, I, as I write about this stuff and how I felt in the haves and the have-nots and the racial divide and whatnot, it more and more now it, it's it's we you know we all have to grow up into life. We all get you know the the nice little place we we see when we pop out the shoot. For all of us, is going to disappoint us a little ways down the road. You know, and if I may just pontificate a little, it's because we are all each born, born with a soul. And we're each born to be creatures of paradise, and we want to be in paradise. But the, you know, the, th the three dimensions and five senses can't get near what we yearn for. So, you know, that's the human condition. Yes? Every time I walk in the Emerald Theater, this is my house right here. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, when they tore those houses down and built the Emerald Theater, so many feelings you go through. Mm. And every time I come to the library, I think about when I was a little girl and used to look wow. across the street at the county home and see the girls playing. And now I'm working for the village, and mm. it's all those memories are there. Thank you for inviting me into your home this evening. <laughs> You know, and the other part was we, we were situated, not, typically if you were black in, in Mamaroneck at the time we moved, you lived in the flats. And we didn't leave, live in the flats. And that was considered a good thing because the flats were supposed to be, have bad influence. You know, but, but it, it's really a sticky question because, you, you know, it seems to be upward, up anyway, upwardly mobile or to move towards what's good, you have to leave what you, your roots, you have to sort of disavow where you came from. That's another trick, sticky wicked, and I guess that happens to everybody in a way, too. But, um, you know, it, it's odd, you know, being from a community where from the get-go, speaking of the flats, it's understood that you'd be well to escape. It's not a great launch. And you had your hand out. Oh, yes. yes, my name is uh, Stanley. Hi, Stan. Um, you know, the, uh, listening to what you were saying, um, you know, the part about uh, substance abuse and homelessness, you know, I know that can really be really debilitating and it really robbed one's spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, what inspired you, what gave you the, the inner fiber to, to pursue your, your, your ambition to write? What, what rekindled that fire in which homelessness and substance abuse just the ability to well, I'd really, well, you know what I'd really like to do, stand up here and tell you about my inner strength and character and all that, but you know what? That's not the way it happened. The, the reason I got, you know, clean and sober is because I had, been, I had my butt kicked. I had, no, just, I had nothing left. You know, it wasn't any noble ambition. I didn't have any other choice. Um, so I'll uh, disavow that. As far as the writing thing, the, the writing thing was actually turned into my, I mean, 
going through the, I mean, getting rid of chemical dependency is small potatoes. You do that like that. What really gets you is that here I was for 12 years telling my, my psyche, my body, the, my human machine that living at this pace is normal. Then you go back to this pace and your whole body rebels. It says, what's wrong? Where are you? Because your body will learn to accept anything as normal, you know, short of, you know, death. And so you go through a year or so where it's just gut-wrenching. You can, every second of time pauses just long enough to scratch against your nerve and then move on. And then you have all these emotions that you've suppressed swimming up and down. You know, they're alien to you. Why am I depressed, you know? Why am I this? Why am I that? Well, it's, it's an emotion, you know. It's only an emotion. But it's a frightening thing if you have, for 10 years, if you haven't had much emotions. They're very frightening. They're very powerful. So all during that time, the only thing I could drag myself to do, other than go to meetings, was get in front of that thing and try and write a book. Try and do something, trying to dig my way to the other end. So that's how that came out. Of nothing noble, <laughs> you know. Nothing noble at all. Yes. Fred. Hi, Fred. Hi. Are you reading across the board now, or is you reading channels in a certain way? No, I've always been a, uh, a, a very what's the word I'm looking for? The very um, indiscriminate reader. Whatever comes in, you know, I, I read what comes across my eye, my field of vision. That's interesting. I don't, I don't get channels. Most people do that, you know, they get into channels, but I'm very kind of zen and about it. Just, uh, if it got to me, it must be for me some way. So right now, I've, I've, my last bit of reading was uh, a book called Blindness by Saramago. It won, doesn't it? It won the, uh, not the Pulitzer, the Nobel Prize. The, the interesting thing, real quickly, about that book is it deals with a society that is, the entire society goes blind, all except one woman. But the translation it was is either that was his intent or the translator's intent. They put commas where they should, where we usually put periods, and they don't attribute the quotes with quote marks or indentations. And to me, what was brilliant about that is the feeling is you're groping along, just like if you were blind. That, that knocked me out. I said, well, that's brilliant if it's on purpose. And the people had no names. Had no names. They were only by description. Right? Every single time. Every yep. And, uh, you know, that's my la latest reading. Yes, sir? From a recent book, mm -hmm. you had a job. Right. I mean, uh, if that person hadn't offered you the crack, would someone else have bought it? Would you have gotten into it? Or uh, was it just at the low, a bad luck that at that moment you met the wrong person? And, or what happened? I'm glad that it happened. Okay. Yeah, I am glad. Because, you know, as I said before, the beginning of this story is about a guy who's not very happy with the world or life or himself and can't find out why. Yes, but that, that doesn't make you happy. That's what the stuff to maintain, you know? It didn't make me happy. I had, I had my own business. I, I was living on Central Park West. I had a closet full of clothes. And I knew it wasn't a, a matter of degree. You know, if I make more money and get a bigger, then I'll be happy. I knew instinctively that wasn't going to do it. And, mo and many of us feel like that way. As I said before, we all have souls and we all long for something more than we've got. Some of us have forgotten or given up, but we all suffer a little being, you know, we, in, this, in this, I figure we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Most of us look at it this, the other way around, and we suffer from this, but most of us can maintain, you know, the world has a lot of things to keep you busy and diverted from this. You can go right to the grave going on to this thing and that thing and the latest this and latest that and then it's over. 
So I was lucky. I went to the last page of that book, and and it was either die or live. And if I and, and to live to to get yourself, there's only one place left to go when you've done the, the drug and alcohol thing, and that is to go for a spiritual uh, uh, awakening. And uh, I went the twelve. What the twelve step program is, uh, I found out are less about drugs and alcohol then they are about exploiting the opportunity that exists for in, in, in people who've been through that to accept, and that's all you got to do, accept the possibility of a spiritual way of living. I'm not, now, when I say spiritual, I know there's some churchgoers here, and, and it's perfectly all right as far as that goes, but I'm not speaking specifically of going to church. I'm talking, I'm speaking about the stuff you go to church for. Anyone else? Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's most likely, I, you know, you, wherever you are, you bring your fears with you. So I had plenty of fears, I guess, before that. And um, the thing about the addiction to something as strong as crack is that everything else gets sublimated. You may fear, but it doesn't matter. You're going to get high. You may be hungry, but you're going to get high. You may want, but you're going to get high. So. You're going to come down. Well, there was a, and nothing extra dangerous to me. I mean, I, they were, if I saw a murder, I had a gun put in my face and all this, but there was nothing extra dangerous to me about being on the streets. The way I looked at it is I didn't have anything anybody wanted. <laughs> you know, most, most people who commit crime or into crime, they're out to get something they believe is in their self-interest. And I say, hey, pal, what do I got that's in your self-interest unless it's this rock? And you're going to have to fight me for that. But um, the interesting thing, though, was that the reverse of that was being, you know, if, if the first thing you want to do is go get a hit, you'll find courage. You know, and I, I got to face down a lot of fears I had. I mean, I... I would, you know, I lived there for the most part. I lived in the safe parts of cities most of my life. I mean, I lived in Mamarinic, not even the, the unsafe part of this safe town I didn't live in. And I lived on the Upper West Side, you know. Now I'm, dip, I'm running around Spanish Harlem in Brooklyn where bu bullets fly. And I got rid of a lot of fears of that whole place and therefore disconnection from all those people. You know, I got to know people I would have been a, a shy to, you know, kept away from all my life. So, so I did face down a few fears. Uh huh. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know how long I have the room for, but you give me a signal when it gets a little late, please. Well, and well, yes. What kind of a student were you in Mamarinic, and when did you leave? Uh, the kind of student I was in Mamarinic is when I was in grade school. My second period class was principal's office. <laughs> I was always in trouble. In fact, it, it, it escalated to the point where Bob Nagel, who was the first one in that entire school to take a nonviolent psychological approach, caring approach to students, chased me out of the building. <laughs> That's how bad I was. But it, again, it, 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 it there was a lot of stuff swirling underneath that I had no, I, had, I didn't know about. I didn't even know why I was angry. I didn't even know I was angry. Um, then I went, I got sent to a, what we call a stay away school, not quite a reform school, but for three years. And I came back and they put me, in, they looked at me in, in uh, Maronick High School and immediately gave me the CDED. I think some people know it. Culturally disadvantaged, economically deprived, or economically disadvantaged, culturally deprived, or 
and, and they immediately put me in the, a special class, which had a, the history book was, this was history, was about this thick. And what I hated about it is, nobody in that class, with the exception of myself, could read. And what they, we would do each day was everyone would read in turn. It was like sitting in a dentist's office getting your teeth grinded. <laughs> and then, but they realized, it's, I think they did testing, and they realized it, and then they jumped me a grade. So I, you know, it was, uh, uh, but, in, it, but I finally settled down, I think the last couple of years I got into, I went to, into movie making, and uh, there was a kid in there named Robert Rucco whose parents lived out in Saxon Woods. I mean, they had money. And so I hung out with him, and I, and I coaxed him into coaxing his father into buying all this film stuff. I mean, sound and lights and all this stuff. And I made him a producer. <laughs> and uh, we ran around trying to make a, a film in the school. And, and uh, we, I, I wrote this script called, I remember, called Operation A. And it was a course between I Spy and James Bond. And we, we started filming this thing. And I think we got it to the point where it called, the script called for us to blow up the east wing of the high school. <laughs> they, they thought this is a little unreasonable for the sake of art. And, uh, and so uh, those last few years, I did a lot better. Any, anyone else? Any more so, so when you left, then you went to the streets? Is that it? No, 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 no. There was a, you want me to tell the whole book, huh? <laughs> Listen, I'll lend you 2195. No, I'm only kidding. No, there was a lot in between. As a matter of fact, I got a student aid scholarship my last year which is determined by certain economic uh, means testing or whatever they call it. I got a student aid, I got two, two things. In, this was in the year when the government spent tons of money and a lot of brain thrust and time and sweat and energy to try to engineer society. And, what they, and they were throwing tons of money at CDEDs, like myself. By my last year of high school, they were afraid, get this, that I was going to drop out so I could run to work and help support my mother. I, would, I wasn't any rush to go to work. <laughs> I would have hung out for another year, you know. I was very much Westchester at that time. We Westchester kids hung out. They didn't rush to work. And, uh, and uh, so they gave me, they got me a job at the post office part time at a very nice wage to keep me from, you know, abandoning my future to go get this money we needed. So I had a job at the post office for, for the last year. And then I, I got the scholarship thing and I went. It, they bought me a, it was a $500 scholarship to RCA Institute and a course called TV Production and Studio Operation. And I went, it was, I went in every, what was it, every twice a week or every day for, I don't remember, in the evenings I had to go into New York City. Great course, we got to do the cameras and the switchers and the, and the, we, we could stage man, we did everything you could do in, in hands on. The only problem is when you graduate the course, it doesn't qualify you to put so much as a toe into any real legitimate, <laughs> legitimate broadcast operation. For that, you needed a class B operator's license. And to get that, you have to take a whole host of grunt courses. And we're not talking about twisting knobs now. We're talking about learning, you know, what decibels, uh, with the whole nine yards. And I had shot my wad. Then Bob Geller, who was my teacher then, it, uh, told me of this the community film workshop. And they were training pe uh, people to work in the TV news industry. Again, government ed uh, edu uh, engineering. It was the Office of Economic Opportunity wanted to, quote, Increase minority participation in the news gathering, blah, 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 blah. So I hooked into that and I got trained as a newsreel cameraman and I went and I worked for a year and a half at KERA Public Television in Dallas and went from there to Detroit. In Dallas, I was so new and, and fresh and had just seen e Easy Rider before I went there. And I was so, every time I saw a pickup truck with a gun rack on it, I would 
And I actually, that fear actually had helped me lose my job because I was at the Dallas, I was there in a year and a half and I finally got, they had a, something to film at the Dallas Press Club and I was there all alone, only black face there. And, and everything went wrong for me. And, and, and the guy comes over and says, uh, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story, but the guy finally says, let me, sh let me show you how to wind cable, boy. And all I had to hear was boy. And I just walked right out, left three, $4,000 worth of equipment there and walked out, which you don't do. And I was fired. Got a job in Detroit. Detroit's a black city. Got a job in Detroit. I go there to WTVS. Now the thing I, you need to know is that WTVS, Detroit Public Television, which is in the heart of Detroit City, exists at the leisure of the Bloomfield Hills crowd in the suburbs. So they, they're the ones who send all the money on so, and so they can see Masterpiece Theater and whatnot. But to ratify this franchise sitting in the middle of a 40% black town, they need to scatter some black faces around. Now, you figure there'd be plenty of homeboys to do this. The problem is in that time in Detroit, you were either gonna go work for the, on the assembly line, you're gonna become a cop, a priest, or a pimp. That was it. They didn't train you to do anything else. So they called me up and I, I come in the first day feeling, thinking I'm, you know, Steven, well, not Steven Spielberg, didn't exist then, but feeling like, you know, I'm a hot shot, and then a guy sits me down, a guy named Jack, and he looks at me, and he says, first thing out of his mouth, he says, I gotta hire a black man, just like that. Then he whips out this payment schedule, and goes, and uh, this is what I think it'll take to buy you. So that was my introduction to Detroit TV, uh, you know, I used cognitive dissonance. I told him, well, that's just business talk. He wasn't trying to buy it, you know. A year later, he calls me into his office and says, I got to let you go. And that was it. <laughs> Whatever use they had for me was done. So then I, I worked for Cal Schleck after that in the Instructional Material Center. And after that, then I went on to be an art, uh, do this whole artist in residence thing. It was all this stuff is, gov is municipal. Like, these are the municipal years. Everything was either government this or municipal that. Um, and then I ran out of that stuff and uh, started my own thing. And that I started uh, doing graphic design because I used to make my own titles for film. And I just started doing it and uh, built up a little business. And then uh, my partner died, then my brother died, and then my father died, and that brings you up to date to the beginning of the book. Thank you. You're welcome. Now you don't. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I think we can go you know, to signing now. Wouldn't you, would you agree? Um, I have some, I brought along some copies of the book for those of you who don't have them. If you'd like to purchase a copy, and I'd be happy to sign them, the twenty-one ninety-five. I didn't make the price, but I'm glad it is twenty-one ninety-five. Um, those of you who have books already and would like me to sign your copies, I'd be happy to do that too. And thank you very much for listening.